welcome to the stage Communications Director for UC Davis of Law and substitute host of Insight on Capital Public Radio, Miss Pamela Wu. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the sixth annual Parent University Lecture Series. This is the fourth year that I've been the series moderator, and it is always an honor and really a pleasure to be with you. I learned something new and important with every one of these presentations, and I hope that that is true for all of you as well. I have been reading the book, The Dolphin Way, by Dr. Shimmy Kang, tonight's presenter. And it's really resonated with me. I am someone who was raised by strict tiger parents, Chinese immigrants who always demanded straight A's. And now I am married to a man who was raised by very permissive parents, who Dr. Kang refers to as jellyfish parents. <laughs> what do you get when you cross tiger with jellyfish? Seriously, though, we're the parents of a three-year-old, and I, I often think about this. I wonder how to find that good middle ground between tiger and jellyfish, because I don't want to put my son through the same kind of high-pressure experience that I had. And at the same time, my husband says he really wants to encourage our son more than he was encouraged as a child. He often says, I wish that my parents had pushed me a little bit harder. So it is really a revelation to discover the dolphin way. As parents, we often talk about seeking balance in our lives, in our children's lives. But the question is, what does that mean in practice? I know that a lot of you have probably said, I'm seeking some balance. But what does that mean? What does that look like? Thankfully, Dr. Shimi Kang is here to explain how we already have the answers inside of us. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to recognize the community leaders who are with us this evening. Please stand when I call your name. Good evening to the superintendent for DJUSD, Winfred Robertson. <laughs> Assistant superintendent, Dr. Clark Bryant. <laughs> New school board member, Barbara Archer. And the very popular executive director of the Davis Legacy Soccer Club and former DHS varsity soccer coach, Ashley Uden. We would also like to recognize Davis Media Access, DMA, for taping tonight's lecture. For the many who could not attend and be here tonight, the taping is going to be available on the DMA website by the end of January. Of course, I'd also like to recognize our community sponsors, the Avid Reader. They're in the lobby, and Avid Reader is going to donate 10% of Dr. Kang's book sales to Davis Parent University tonight. Also, I'd like to recognize the DJUSD Climate Committee, Chad DeMasi of the DeMasi Real Estate Group, Hallmark Inn, UC Davis, Richard Mandelaris and Associates, and Bacharini's Martial Arts. So here's how tonight's going to go. We're going to start with a 50-minute talk by our keynote, followed by a 20-minute question and answer session. You will have an opportunity to ask questions of our esteemed speaker. Then we're going to end the evening with a book signing in the front foyer, and doors are going to close here at 9 p.m. If you have a burning question for Dr. Kang, you can just jot down your question on the index card that you were given when you first arrived. We're going to be collecting those cards immediately after the talk. And now, tonight's keynote, Dr. Shimmy Kang, author of The Dolphin Way, A Parent's Guide to Raising Healthy, Happy, and Motivated Kids Without Turning Into a Tiger. Dr. Shimmy Kang is an award-winning Harvard-trained doctor, researcher, and expert on human motivation. She offers the tools that people of all ages need to succeed in the workplace and at home. Dr. Kang helps to cultivate the skills needed to flourish both personally and professionally. The Dolphin Way is already a number one bestseller in Canada. Dr. Kang also has written articles featured in the Huffington Post, Psychology Today, and Time Magazine. And you may have seen her on television before as well, because major media outlets often call upon her for her expertise. Dr. Kang is currently the medical director of Child and Youth Mental Health for Vancouver and a clinical associate professor at the University of British Columbia. She is most proud of receiving the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for her years of outstanding community service and, of course, very proud of being the mother of three awesome children. Please welcome to the stage and welcome to Davis, Dr. Shimmy Kang. Thank you so much, Bud. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that kind introduction. Hi, everyone. 
It is such a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited. I've had a very rainy two days. Um, uh, I will take credit for bringing the rain to Davis because I'm from Vancouver Pacific Northwest. And, uh, but I hear you need it, so that's wonderful. Can I just start by saying thank you to the DPU, uh, your chairwoman, uh, Christy Fries, and all of the DPU representatives. Could you just stand for a moment and uh, be acknowledged for your hard work? Uh, I've been so impressed with the amount of dedication, commitment, and work. Uh, we've had phone calls. I've talked about the audience and like, tell me who they are. They've been really, um, really invested in making sure that this is a worthwhile event for you. And I know that you have children and you have to-do lists and long email chains at home. So we really want to make sure that this night uh, is going to give you exactly, or at least some of what you need in your home and in your professional life too. Can I just get a, a sense of the audience? How many people have kids elementary school and younger? Okay, all right. How about middle school, high school, young adults? And young adult goes up to age 24, actually, right? The human brain doesn't fully finish its maturation until about then. Um, men mature a little bit longer, that's a fact. So I'm 25. <laughs> Okay, great. So we're going to try to touch on all these age groups. The tools and techniques um, are things that I've used for over 15 years in my practice, my personal life. I'm hoping that you can use them in all of your relationships, in all aspects of your life. Um, so really giving you not just some parenting tips, but um, personal and business or uh, uh, corpor corporations. I, I give these same tools uh, to different audiences. So. We're going to talk about what skills equal 21st century success. And that's a really important uh, sentence there because we're talking about, we're going to talk about the current world we live in, the 21st century, the, a rapidly changing, a ultra competitive, a fast paced, technologically driven, globally connected world that our kids are going to be thriving in, living in, growing in, competing in, and working in. And that's really what we want to get to the heart of today. Uh, and what skills equal success in that century? So I'd love to be interactive with you. Uh, when I heard the audience is full of PhDs and MDs and MD PhDs, I'm like, boy, um, uh, it'd be wonderful to hear from you. Uh, and I'm hoping to do that uh, after as well. But my way of being interactive, I'm going to ask you questions. And I'd like you to answer that question in your own mind or tell a friend you're sitting beside because that's really going to help um, uh, you to formulate and walk the path, walk the trail um, that I'm hoping to get to. So ask yourself, what is success? When you, when you think of that word for your family, for your child, what are you thinking of when you think of success? And I know that it's not getting into a certain university. Um, as a parent myself, I know all of you parents are wanting health for your children, are wanting a certain amount of security for your children. You're wanting them to have a life of passion, a life of purpose, of meaning and joy. That's our definition of success tonight. And that is a very high expectation, I know, but um, that's what we want. And we don't have to settle for a low achieving, uh, happy person, happy child, or a high achieving, miserable child. We don't have to settle for, we don't have to choose between being practical and being passionate. We don't have to choose between being competitive and collaborative. Uh, we can have it all week, and there are families and there are children that have experienced this. And so that's really the bar we're setting for tonight. We're going to talk about how do we cultivate uh, this type of success, this very broad definition of success. Now you may be thinking, wow, that sounds really ambitious to do in one hour, um, but we it's actually quite simple. Um, and I'm going to say that uh, the secret to parenting, the secret to life, is simple but not easy. And knowing uh, what to do is not the same as doing it. And you've all experienced moments of passion, purpose, meaning, and joy in your lives. You've all experienced triumphs. You know how you got there if you take a moment um, to think about it. So. Knowing is not doing, and this kind of struck me when I became a parent uh, of, I have three children, and I couldn't figure out why I was having such a hard time with my three kids, given my resources, given my education, given the fact I was the medical director of an entire city for child and youth mental health, 
all of my research on motivation. I couldn't figure out why this was so hard. When I looked at my own mother, who uh, was never given an opportunity to even go to school. She never even went to grade one. She grew up in a village and she successfully raised five kids. And I knew that I was missing something very simple and very powerful. But like I said, knowing isn't doing and simple is not easy. So you're gonna hear tools and ideas and you're gonna, they're gonna sound very simple to you. But simple is not easy when we think of things like drinking water uh, is simple, but 80% of Americans are dehydrated. Sleeping is simple, but sleep deprivation is a crisis situation. So when we look at the simple things, they are the most powerful and they are the most intuitive to us too. Uh, intuition is actually the knowledge gifted to us by nature. And it is common sense, the knowledge common to everyone. And I realized my mom was parenting from her intuition. She never read parenting books or blogs. She can't read. In fact, she hasn't read my book. Uh, and she was asking me, it's actually quite interesting. She, she asked me, there it is. She asked me when I was putting all the science in, because I read 900 articles and reviewed 40 books, and there's 300, over 300 references in the Dolphin Way. She asked me, why do you need so much science for common sense stuff, like sleep and sunlight and collaboration and encouraging your child and not pushing too hard, but, not having, but also having rules? And uh, she told me, she goes, you know, Shimmy, she's like, no one's going to read your book. Uh, it's, it doesn't sound very earth shattering to me. It sounds very common sense. And um, so she was surprised when it became a number one bestseller. Um, and it's being translated into Germany. Uh, this year, German, Russia, and China um, are all, it's going to be launched this year in all three countries. And uh, it, there's a funny story. That's the German cover right there. Uh, and recently, Der Spiegel, which is a German investigative magazine, came from Germany to interview me. And they spent two days in my home. And not to stereotype, but these were very serious investigative journalists from Germany in my home. Um, and at the end of the two days, they asked me, uh, do you ever feel like you're under a microscope? And I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then they also asked me, what's my life like now that I wrote this parenting book and I did all this research and I'm doing all these speaking events? And I said, well, yeah, life is pretty good. You know, I have an um, oldest son, Josh. He used to be a, he's a total sports junkie, but now he does his homework, no problem, like just sits down and does it. And that's my daughter, Gia, and she hates nighttime routine and going to sleep. And she just brushes her teeth and puts her pajamas on and falls to bed, falls to sleep. And my middle son, Javer, he's the pickiest eater in the world, and he's just eating bags and bags of broccoli. So life is great. And um, that would be nice if it was true. Uh, <laughs> this is the truth, uh, more often than not. And uh, you know, my friends, parenting is hard work. Uh, we're all in it together. We struggle. Uh, I struggle. And I actually don't believe in the term parenting experts. I said that this morning on NPR. We've never needed experts for all of human history. Why do we need them now? We need our intuition. We need our common sense. Um, and only you know your children. And only you know yourself and what is needed. So really, we're, we're going to talk about that, that very powerful thing, that very simple thing um, that can help get us through all the noise. They asked me why I wrote the book. And uh, I said that, well, I'm not a parenting expert, but I do have expertise in some things, and one of them is motivation. Um, through my work in research and addiction, and my, child, um, my interest in child and youth mental health, I work with thousands of families, and I've seen how hard it can be. And um, I want to be alongside. I want to I be part of this journey with my fellow pod mates, my fellow parents, because it is hard work. Uh, and the research is amazing, and I didn't know this until I started researching the book, but the parent's brain changes, just like our brain changes in puberty. The myelination and degenerate, it, it shifts, and you can actually see this. Uh, and it's not just in the pregnant mo mother, but also the partner or even adoptive parents of a newborn. And I say it's like puberty all over again, but with even more angst uh, than that time. So, and the reason why I wrote the book is because I believe, um, I do believe that we are in trouble. In, in, uh, when I look at uh, what's happening in the world, uh, when I look at our lifestyles, 
when I look at my when I looked at my lifestyle, when I looked at the lifestyle of the kids that I was working with, of the people around me, my friends and colleagues, I say we're kind of in this state of negative evolution, um, this weird paradox. And when you think about it, never before in human history have we had such conveniences, yet never before have our lives been so stressful. Never have we had such knowledge at the tip of a finger, push of a button, yet never have we had such illness. Of course, diseases like uh, addiction, anxiety, depression, obesity, diabetes are all rooted in our genetics, but they're all going up, not because of our genes, but because of our lifestyles. Never before have parents been so involved in their kids' lives, ever in human history. Yet never have our kids been so unhealthy with rising rates of all of those things. And it struck me, and it's not our imagination that the world is getting more stressful. Uh, I interned at the WHO in Geneva many years ago, and, and they think very long and hard before they release statements like this. Um, and the statement that they release is stress, is the 21st century epidemic. Uh, any of you feel stress in your lives? Okay. So we all feel it. This is, this is the sign of our times. This is the environment our children are growing up in. And it is different. And it is a paradox because you would think we've come so far, yet our lives are more, the most stressful they've ever been. And when we think about stress, this slide is really important. And maybe we could even, this, if we get this slide, then um, I think we've really understood a lot tonight. Stress releases stress hormones. Adrenaline puts us into freeze, fight, and flight. It's going to happen to anyone. When we go look at the research, take someone from Iceland or Africa. In a stressful environment, they're going to release, these, they're going to release hormone, um, adrenaline and cortisol, and they're going to go into freeze, fight, or flight. These are our instincts, and they make us run on automatic. Now, the way I see it, I think of freeze. Think of anxiety. You're frozen. Your child might be anxious. Flight is escape, distraction, too much shopping, too much drinking, too much gambling, too much drugs and alcohol, whatever it might be. Too much scheduling, you're checking out. And the fight is irritability, anger. And if we can understand that this is how, if the 21st century is functioning in the highest level of stress, then we're a group of humans functioning in freeze, fight, or flight instincts. And that's no way to parent. It's okay if you're being run by, chased by a lion. When we are in a place of calm, then our intuition kicks in. Our intuition is what allows us to make conscious choices. And if, when we're calm, we make those same choices, then they're probably the right choices. And that's how we want to be parenting. So it's, when, when I looked at myself, I realized that I was in this mode. I was in this automatic reaction mode. And it was a real awakening for me to say, if this can happen to me, and I'm a psychiatrist, um, and I've spent all my time, many, many years researching the human brain, and if I can fall into this so easily as a parent, then my goodness, of course this is happening uh, across the board. So please remember this. I think this is a really important um, uh, point as we go about our day. And an easy way to get out of freeze, fight, or flight and into a place of Calm intuition is simply slowing down, deep breaths. Simple, not easy. Okay, so how did we get here as parents? And I talked to a lot of parents. One of the top things that came up uh, uh, in terms of why parenting is so stressful is the admissions criteria for universities and colleges. They have gone up steadily over the last 100 years. GPAs are rising. Does that stress any of you out? Okay, and it's the truth, and so we think the entire framework of the plan that we had, you work hard, you get into university, you get a job, you, you'll have healthcare and education, this plan is no longer the pathway. And it is scaring us, it's making us stressed. But there's a whole other list here. Uh, status anxiety is a wonderful term for keeping up. It is a true anxiety. So, um, and it's driven also by technology. So when I go on Facebook and I see you know, my friend's son building a hospital in Guatemala. <laughs> and, you know, my kids digging worm in the backyards. I feel like that's keeping up anxiety. It may not be the fact that 
uh, you know, I want a new uh, purse or a new car, but keeping up regardless of what it is, it brings us, it makes us anxious, it gives us fear. There's so many things that have changed in parenting right now. The media, the 24-hour news cycle, stories of abduction. Abduction hasn't gotten any more than it was before. We hear about it more, it brings in ratings. Globalization, my goodness, our kids are gonna be competing with the superhuman calculators from India and China and the spelling bee champions. What does that mean for, for our children? So it scares us. It scares us, these stereotypes were marketed. Did anyone buy Baby Einstein? Or, so my first son, I had a baby Einstein shower. And the research on baby Einstein ended up showing that in fact kids who watched those videos ended up learning seven words less than kids who didn't. Okay, so we are a big market, parents. Uh, parents are one of the biggest market. We're constantly being marketed. You need another lesson, you need uh, elite coaching, we need elite um, drills and soccer and this and that. So, all of these things, work life and balance, has made us sometimes it's easier to put our kids in a schedule, in an activity, well at least they have something to do. Um, the economic security, anyone here the, the 10,000 hour rule? Of course you have. So one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Gladwell, in The Outliers talked about this 10,000 hour rule that would lead to an outlier. Now, did he mean 10,000 hours of parent-driven structured activity that was going to lead to an outlier? Right, okay, he didn't mean that. He gave examples of Bill Gates. He gave examples of the Beatles. They got their 10,000 hours from passion, curiosity, driven, generally unstructured uh, exploration, play, and an environment that was conducive to becoming an outlier. So all of these things have led us to this place of fear. Fear, stress, automatic reaction, and we ended up being disconnected from our intuition, from our gut. Does anyone remember saying this when you're driving your kid to and from an activity, or they're stressed and you're pushing them out the door, or you're not feeling good about what's happening? Have any of you said this to yourself? This is what I used to say to myself all the time. And in fact, it's the first section of the dolphin way is called this doesn't feel right but everyone else is doing it and it is true it is across the board like i mentioned across the world uh, when you look at the parenting research uh, we are in a trend that's called over parenting there's certain behaviors that are happening now that haven't happened to this degree before and i say it's serious under parenting because it's under preparing our children for real life sabotaging their self-motivation uh, and their ability to adapt to a very rapidly cha uh, changing world. Have you heard the term Krispies? Okay, so Krispies, um, these terms have actually come out of California. Uh, in terms of the, the um, words to describe the youth showing up on campuses. Burnt out, been working since four, they show up on campus at 19, they have nothing more to give to their campus community, to, they're just done. Um, I see a lot of crispies in my practice, overscheduled kids, we know that's a very big topic. 40% of children are sleep deprived because they're too busy. And as a physician, and, and many of you I know are in this room, I tell those parents to try to make the point, and you might as well give your kid a pack of cigarettes. It's that bad for their growing brain to be sleep deprived at this really important time, pre-puberty and puberty. Bubble wrap kids, have you heard this term, teacups? Kids that are fragile, lacking resilience, they've been overprotected, bubble wrapped, having a hard time with any mistakes, any failure. And the robot kid, the kid that lacks empathy, hyper competitive, can't think out of the box, can't problem solve, put them in a new situation, they can't quite figure it out. These are unfortunate metaphors. These are unfortunate um, uh, terms that are becoming the lexicon for an entire generation. And, uh, the biggest paradox is what we're seeing and what I've seen in my practice is the most at-risk group is the higher income, the kids of privilege. Medical history was made when there was a risk factor for a health condition that was more likely to occur if you're from higher income. And it was the, it's the only one ever. And it's adolescent anxiety, depression, and addiction. 
So I know um, Dr. Levine talked about this um, perhaps last year, but this is a trend and this is what we're seeing and I'm very sorry, it's all bad news, but <laughs> there's really good news. There's really good news because parents everywhere and there is a lot of kids who are doing just fine, um, parents who are parenting with their intuition, there's moments in our lives where we're able to do that. We know those days, we know how they feel. And in fact, the answer is in us. And when we look at the science of human intuition, I would love to talk to you about it for days. In fact, my next book is gonna be on the human intuition system. So this isn't something that uh, is uh, not scientific. In fact, I started with the quote, look deep into nature and you'll understand everything better. Well, we humans, regardless of how you believe we came on earth, whether it was through God, the universe, mother nature, random chaos, we have lived for most of human history uh, and dependent on a system that tells us when we're in danger, that tells us what to do, that guides us. And it's not just from the brain, we know that the heart is involved, the gut, this concept of gut feeling. In fact, there's more serotonin receptors in our gut than in our brain. Um, think about that when we think about diet, because we use antidepressants, uh, it works on serotonin. Vagus nerves, so there's a really exciting emerging science about this, but that's what we're gonna kinda try to get to today. And my gut told me that I was missing everything in parenting. And I said, you know what, I w if I were to boil this down, uh, what, what should I be really focusing on? Um, is there one skill that might lead to success, to the success that, that I started talking about, the, the broad definition of success? And I knew it couldn't be Kumon math. <laughs> Do you guys have Kumon here? I knew it couldn't be the piano. Um, I knew the one thing wasn't the flute. Uh, it had to be something else. And yet I was putting kind of time into these other activities, which are important, but they weren't the one thing that was gonna lead to success. So if we look at the research and we look at the science, the neuroscience, the biology, the psychology, the reality of this broad definition of success, what do you think it might be, this one thing? Confidence is definitely part of it. Self-esteem self is definitely important and part of it to keep going. Curiosity. Curiosity is, Eleanor Roosevelt had a great quote and it said if there's only one thing a parent could give their child, it would be curiosity. Albert Einstein said, uh, I'm not particularly intelligent, I'm just passionately curious. It's part of it, for sure. Resilience, Resilience ability to get back up after you've been done. Motivation, motivation. Um, okay, so all of these are part of the ingredients. Uh, one of the things I used to thought was passion. Well, I'm like, you have to, you have to have passion. Uh, passion's important, but do you all know passionate artists or entrepreneurs who are kind of stuck, can't move forward? So passion's important, but is it enough? And of course, we think of hard work, grit, this word, Angela Duckworth did the research on spelling bee champions and military cadets. And it's really important work, but I don't want my child to be a spelling bee champion or a military kid. I want this broader definition. So, and we all know hardworking, gritty people who are not so happy, who might even be miserable. Uh, is it a problem-free childhood or a good childhood? As a psychiatrist, of course I thought that's important. That's what we're taught. But again, I'm increasingly seeing kids from very good childhoods in that sense who have high levels of anxiety, depression, and addiction. So the one thing that um, is across the board when you look at the science, the biology, the psychology, the reality of this broad definition of success, I thought it was earth shattering yet predictably obvious at the same time. And the answer was adaptability. Adaptability, when you think about it, simple but not easy. Survival of the fittest doesn't mean the strongest or the fastest. What does survival of the fittest mean? The best fit with an ever-changing environment, like fit like a pair of shoes. Adaptability, wherever you look in nature, made the difference between extinction and flourishing. And not just in nature, but everywhere. 
The dolphin is going to be the metaphor we talk about today. The dolphin is a mammal that's fully adapted to live its life underwater. And the reason why it can thrive in that environment is because it's adapted. Bacteria is actually beating humans right now with our most powerful antibiotics because they keep adapting. This is the power of adaptation. And we see it in the business world. Any of you know these two companies? <laughs> so how did Netflix start? Anyone remember how Netflix started? They used to mail videos to people's homes. And Blockbuster was an industry giant, every corner. Okay, huge difference here in their level of success. Netflix adapted to online streaming, and Blockbuster was offered that model and refused. And Blockbuster is fighting extinction, might even be extinct, uh, definitely is uh, where, where I live, and Netflix is flourishing. So we see this everywhere, everywhere we look, and we don't know what is going to happen in our children's lives. We have no idea what is around the corner for them. Their ability to adapt to whatever comes their way is going to make the difference between success, thriving, and extinction. Now, the grant study of human development is a fascinating study. It started in 1938 in Harvard. And they picked a group of undergrads and they looked at everything. They looked at their height, their weight, their looks, their family background, their IQ, and they followed them for 70 years. Uh, George Valent was the head researcher. And one of the findings, one of the key findings of the Happy Well group, the top 25% quartile, and I quote the study author, was simply the ability to make lemons into lemonade. The ability to adapt, to take whatever comes your way and to make it into lemonade. So this intuitively made sense to me, but then I thought, whoa, how are my kids gonna adapt to a new teacher, to a homework assignment they don't like, to us moving if we divorce, if something happens, if we have to uh, go somewhere else, if they have to start university at a place or at a time they didn't want to their spouse, their work environment. What, what am I teaching them that's going to give them this skill? And it was really, um, uh, I think it was a very thought-provoking question because I realized I wasn't teaching them to adapt, in fact. Over-parenting actually hinders self-motivation, curiosity, confidence, self-esteem, all of these things that we need to actually adapt. So we want to get, get to the place where children can make lemons, uh, lemonade from lemons. And uh, we especially want to do that now, okay? Why? The 21st century is a rapidly changing, very fast-paced time, and ever, never before will our kids need to adapt like they need to now. Do you guys know the key 21st century skills? Can you guys call them out if anyone knows who they are? They're, so I'll start with C. I didn't hear that. Oh, well, uh, the, yeah, well, computers have changed it for sure, shifted it. Uh, yeah, so the communication, creativity, collaboration. Ah, there they are. There they are. So consciousness I added, but let's go through these for a moment. Uh, the key 21st century skills were, uh, are well known in terms of education in the workplace. Now they're going to seem very familiar to you now that you've seen them. Uh, they started with a big conference in 2011, actually, that looked at 60 different institutions and 250 researchers came together. And they said, well, what are the core competencies for this century? Is it really reading, writing, and math? Or is something shifting in the world we live in? And they came up with the creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. In fact, creativity has been it's called the number one competency of a leader by Forbes magazine. When they did a uh, review of the world's top C's, CEOs, they said the, first, the thing that they were looking for the most was creativity. Communication, the ability to communicate among different mediums, not just uh, written, but verbal, online, through uh, emoticons. Uh, communication is becoming absolutely key because it can't be outsourced, it can't be automated. Critical thinking, the ability to solve a problem. 
So the 19th century, we need to, we, as we grew up, we gained status, we gained awards, we gained promotions if you knew the right answer. Well, Google, the internet changed all that. Our kids don't need to know the right answer. They need to know how to ask the right question, how to apply that knowledge to diverse settings, how to filter out the good from the bad data. They need these skills, I call them CQ. And consciousness is the one I added myself because that is moving out of that stress response of freeze, fight, or flight, that running on the hamster wheel, that automatic reaction, and moving into a place of conscious choice, intuition. So in a very rapidly changing world, intuition is now gonna become even more important. I'll give you an example. When I went to the grocery store, I had to buy bread. So there's seven different kinds of bread. There's wheat-free, there's white bread, there's gluten-free, there's seven grain, ancient grain. How was I supposed to make a decision as to which bread I was supposed to buy? And I wasn't able to, how am I supposed to get the data and the studies on all these? I had to make an intuitive choice at that point. So we're, we're at a place that's called CQ um, in terms of this term that I want to use tonight and I hope it sticks because it is an integration of our raw intelligence, IQ, and our emotional intelligence, EQ. It, the debate isn't one or the other, it's an integration of both. And let's walk through that. So this is what I wanted to get to my kids. This is what leads to adaptability. And the good news is, is we can all have this. This is something that can be developed, in fact. IQ is 70% genetics, but creativity is 70% environment and what you do with the brain that you're given. And this concept of neuroplasticity is a wonderful concept. I say it's a fancy word for hope because it means our brains can change always. A 95-year-old brain can change. A really good way to understand neuroplasticity is think of language acquisition. So children learn language quickly and faster than adults. They have more neuroplasticity but a 95-year-old can still learn language, okay? We still have the ability to make those pathways. A nice way to understand neuropla neuroplasticity is think of the analogy of a forest. And our brain, our neural networks are like a forest in many ways. When you go to a forest and you see trails, how did those trails develop? Being used again and again. They're being used again and again, exactly. Our neural networks are exactly the same. When you walk on a trail, in a forest, you create it. When you walk on a trail, mentally, intellectually, you create it. And humans adapt, not by growing beaks or wings. How do we adapt? We adapt cognitively, intellectually, we adapt emotionally, we adapt socially. So all our adaptation is going on in our brains, in our minds. And we do it by walking on a trail. So we can get our kids to walk on the trail of creativity, of curiosity, of collaboration. We can move them off the trail of hyper-competitiveness. If they're saying, you know, I don't want to try that. I might fail. That's, I'm not good at that. They've walked on those trails. And part of what we can do as parents and educators is to help them shift, shift the trail they're walking on. And, but we can't force it. And so let's talk about how do we raise 21st century adaptable children. OK, so you guys with me? Now we're into how do we do this. So part one is balanced parenting. And I use the metaphor of the tiger, dolphin, and jellyfish, which Pamela was very, um, very clever and, and, and very honest and open in discussing uh, earlier. So this is a metaphor, it's not a label. And uh, when I am exhausted, uh, I may become the jellyfish parent. My kids might be beating each other up and I just pretend I don't see it. Um, and when I, feel my kids are falling behind. Uh, I may feel that they're losing out in the competitive world. I may become the tiger and start pushing and hovering. And when I'm in balance, when I remember what I'm wanting, when I remember my definition of success and how to get there, I'm more likely to be that dolphin parent. So let's walk through these a little bit. This is really important because we think of the tiger parent as the overbearing parent berating their child for a piano, three hours, burning all the stuffed animals, not allowing ba bathroom breaks. Okay, of course it's exaggerated, but, but that's one type of tiger parent. 
The other type of authoritarian parent is the helicopter parent, that micromanaging parent, the bubble wrap parent, the parent that is constantly kind of there, uh, problem solving, stepping in, swooping in. That is a tiger too, because they're both authoritarian. There's authoritarian directing and there's authoritarian protecting. Either way, we take over what we call internal control and internal motivation, okay? Now, why is this so confusing for parents? Why are people so attached to this idea? And the part of the reason is we see short-term performance, okay? So tiger, short-term, we do see performance. If you've ever worked in a tiger environment, or let's say you worked in a workplace and a tiger boss walks in, for a little while, people might step up, they might get their job done, but what happens over the long run, what we need to kind of keep going, that fuel, that curiosity, that self-motivation, that emergence of talent and cooperation ends up getting impeded, okay? Because there's either you're being micromanaged or you're being pushed. And there is a psychological law, which is called whenever we are pushed, we will push back. Free will is a fundamental biological need of every human. And so what we see over the long run, and the data is very clear. Uh, I dispelled the myth fully in the Dolphin Way book. Um, just a couple weeks ago, the first study of tiger parenting in China came out because it was looked at in every other country, but then the thought was, well, maybe in China it's different because maybe it does work there. Exact same results, anxiety, in difficulty with problem solving, independent thinking, low self-esteem, in fact, poor academic performance than you would um, expect, impaired social skills. All of this makes sense because if you're constantly being hovered or micromanaged or pushed, when are you gonna develop uh, these things? And ultimately what we see is kids that are disconnected, they lack purpose, they are hyper-competitive, they are in that freeze fight flight themselves, they're running on automatic, and they can't adapt. Okay, so that's one end. The other end is the permissive jellyfish parent. So these parents, in, like the jellyfish, okay, like the metaphor, lack rules and expectations, are kind of all over the place, um, and they may be themselves busy, stressed, exhausted, they wanna be their kid's friend, we don't know, but we all have this in us, we can all bring it out in us, and in general, lack authority and guidance. This is really important because I see so many families that are the jellyfish family, because what happens here is initially, these kids look confident, no one's ever said no to them, they kind of walk into a room and they, you know, they, they touch everything, they talk to everyone, but they lack a sense of impulse control, a really important quality that allows us to adapt to have social skills. They don't understand how to respond to teachers, police officers, bosses, a system that requires some authority and understanding. We see increased risk taking, increased drug and alcohol problems. This is really clear. The parenting research has been, this has been the way for decades. And um, jellyfish, I say, actually kill more people in the water than sharks. So don't think this is benign. Um, you know, the book is called Without Turning Into a Tiger, but I think and the jellyfish parenting is, is also a huge problem, and we flip-flop. What happens is we flip-flop. And one thing both jellyfish and tigers have in common is overindulgence. And when we think of that term overindulgence, it's spoiling your child. And we kind of use this term lightly. You know, we say like, oh, I love, you know, I'm on a trip. Oh, I, I love, a, I want to spoil my kids and buy them some stuff when I get home. Uh, or, you know, he's so spoiled. But when you think about that term, spoiled, what does it mean? When you spoil a movie, you ruin it. When you spoil milk, it's not just ruined, it's toxic. So overindulgence, is, the list is huge. This is kids who don't know the difference between needs and wants. We see problems with like video game, constant need for stimulation and entertainment. When we flip flop, the other danger is that overindulgence. <clears throat> the balance, yeah. let's see, the universe wants me, okay, here we go. So the authoritative, the balance, 
is that authoritative dolphin parent. So it is a uh, intuitive approach, I already mentioned, focuses on a bonded, a connection, guiding. Okay, guiding is different than directing versus no guidance. Uh, it is a approach that relies on role modeling, your community, adaptable. Okay, the dolphin parent is adaptable because your kids are gonna change. They're not gonna be the same at two or five or 10. And if you have multiple kids, I have three kids, they're all very different. It's a firm yet flexible approach. My older son needs less firmness. He's cautious, he's a bit anxious already. So I loosen the reins on him. My daughter is like a firecracker. She'll like jump off a cliff. I have to tighten the reins on her. It's an adaptable approach and it's constantly changing in, in the, and we have to use our intuition for that high expectations, okay? That idea of success, far beyond uh, getting into a university, far beyond a particular career. Balancing rules and protection with autonomy and choice. So that's the balanced approach. The data is very clear that uh, dolphin kids, that the authoritative balanced approach, we see kids who develop impulse control because they're not, they don't have jellyfish parents who have no rules and and protection uh, or expectations, but they learn how to make decisions, independent thinking, because they're not being tired. They're not author they don't have authoritarian parents. They, just, they are able to enhance their creativity, their problem solving. They have higher self-confidence. We see better academic performance. We see better mental health. We see better self-motivation. And isn't that what we really want, is kids who are self-motivated? They're gonna leave our basements. They're not gonna be there. Um, eating pizza and video games when they're 30. Uh, and that's true, actually. Gen Me studies show that uh, when, they, when they did a survey on um, Generation Me, kids under the age of, uh, born 1980 after, when they asked them when's a reasonable time to leave your parents' home, it was 30. Um, so it's, and I think I'm worried our kids is gonna be 40. Okay, so here's a really good way to experience what a dolphin relationship might be like. Um, I hear the superintendent of the district is here. Is he here? Okay. I can't see. Okay, so this one's for the teachers. Um, it's so nice to have you here. Uh, I want you all to think of your favorite teacher, okay? Whether it was elementary, junior high, high school. Think of that teacher and think of the qualities that that teacher had and just shout them out. Encouraging. Enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. Funny. Funny. Supportive. Supportive. Caring. caring, of course. Caring is really important. That's how cults work, by the way. Um, if you ever think caring is not important, because that's how a cult leader gets um, everyone to follow them, is because they care about the person. It's highly motivating to be cared for. What else? They believe in you, sure. Boundaries. Boundaries. Okay, my audience plant over there. Um, you're absolutely right. Boundaries are important. How did you feel in this favorite teacher's classroom? Secure. Se what, say it again? Secure. Secure, yes. Ready to take a risk, ready to learn. How else? Informed. Informed. Important. Important, yes. Engaged. Anyone would say inspired? Yes, we have all the ins here. Okay, inspired, motivated. Now, your favorite teacher, I can guarantee you, was a dolphin personality. You might have had many jellyfish teachers who were very nice people, very kind, very well being, uh, very well intentioned. Maybe you had a blast in those classes. Why wasn't the jellyfish teacher your favorite teacher? Lost control of the classroom. And why is that important? You didn't grow. You didn't grow. Right, absolutely. We humans are feet face forward. We are self-motivated. We want to grow. We want to learn. We have it built in in us. The jellyfish teacher might have been fun, but it wasn't your favorite teacher. Why wasn't the tiger teacher the strict micromanaging teacher, your favorite teacher? No fun. no fun. There's no fun. There's no creativity. There's no growth. You might have gotten even a good grade, but where's the growth? Where's the learning? 
Where is this forward progress? So that's the power of this relationship. How many of you had a hard time remembering your favorite teacher? It's incredible. Just like that, within seconds, maybe you haven't thought of this person in a decade or two, you can remember his or her name, her face, what it felt like. That's the power of this relationship. And we can be the favorite teacher with our children. The metaphor of the dolphin, they're always going together forward. It's a shoulder to shoulder approach. So I'm hoping to use the visuals, the metaphor, to really bring this point home is our feet face forward. We're meant to move forward. We want to move forward. And a firm yet flexible, their body is firm yet flexible, warmth with control, love with limits. So your favorite teacher, I'm pretty sure was a dolphin. If they weren't, let me know. Okay, Jody has my email. You can email me. I'd love to talk about it. Okay, so let's get to some specifics. How do we develop this approach? Simple, not easy. Simple, statements and behaviors that foster internal control. Okay, we can never say this enough with our kids. Uh, I'll give you an example. When my uh, five-year-old, let's say a couple years ago, he didn't want to go to kindergarten. He's completely having a meltdown. Um, my statement of internal control, my being firm yet flexible dolphin was, like, you know, Jaber, I am your mommy and you do have to go to kindergarten. That's not an option, so there's my firm. So I can pick you up and I can take you there. However, here comes the internal control. I can't do that forever. And when you're there, I can't make you learn. I can't make you like it. I can't make you pay attention. That's all up to you. There's the internal control. Firm yet flexible. Simple, not easy. And we balance that with statements of encouragement and support. If there's a problem, let me know. Okay, we can find a way. I'm here for you, I'm a resource. If I'm not around, maybe we can talk to your teachers. So it's this balanced approach that you can do it, it's in your hands, but I'm with you. I'm shoulder to shoulder with you. We want to let our children try first before we step in and provide feedback. Okay, that is the signal of internal control, you try it. So with homework, you know, my oldest son wanted me to help him right away, and I had to be like a politician. I always said the same line every time. You have to try it first before I help you. You have to try it first. You know, he'd try all kinds of antics. You have to stick like, you know, the politicians on TV that you can learn from them. Finally, after two weeks, he knew I was going to say the same thing. And then when his little brother came and asked for homework, he actually scripted my whole line. You have to try it first before I help you. So it's a signal. And, it, and it's saying, try it first, but I'm with you. OK, internal control with commitment and support. Uh, are you familiar with the work of um, Carol Duick at Stanford here? Um, she's done some really interesting work on the mindset and um, the fixed versus growth mindset. And excessive or empty praise, when we actually tell a child that they're so smart, they become fixed in the mindset that they're smart. And so that means when they have a problem they can't solve, they may not take the risk and try because it will shatter their paradigm. Versus if we tell a child that they put a lot of effort in, that they try hard, that you're encouraging the process, no matter what comes their way, they're going to be more likely to continue. It's really fascinating research. We want to avoid excessive praise. We want to praise process, not product. So not the number of goals that were scored in a soccer game, but how the game was played, even if there was no goals even if there was no fancy plays, but the effort that's put in. That creates adaptability. This is a really important slide. It might be something you can also use in, if, in your work environments, um, because it's the stages of motivation. And we all go through these stages. I'm going to explain these based on this audience today. So the first stage is pre-contemplation. You, you may have come here today um, in pre-contemplation, being like, you know, I'm really not interested in dolphin way, any changes. I'm pretty happy, um, you know, being a tiger, being a jellyfish, or whatever it is. Not even on your radar. You just came to meet some friends, let's say. Contemplation would be, well, hmm, I wonder if I should make some changes. Let's go see. Let's hear a little bit about it. Um, maybe things aren't going right at home. Maybe kids are anxious. Maybe things are a little bit more tense than you'd like. Determination preparation. I need to make a change. This is the people I see in my office. They've waited to see me. They're ready to take action. They're taking steps. 
and then we take action, and then uh, we can maintain it. So these are the stages of change we all go through for anything, for eating fruits and vegetables, losing weight, whatever it might be. Uh, remember, knowing does not mean doing, right? We all know to eat fruits and vegetables and not text and drive, but we do it anyway because we're often in these different stages. Now, we expect our kids to be in action all the time, all the time for homework, sports, whatever it is, and they're just not going to be in action all the time. They're going to be fluctuating. And when we can understand that motivation is not something someone has or does not have, it is a fluctuating dynamic state, then we can help guide them towards action. A way to do that, let's say it's for a difficult problem, is move them through these different steps. And this is kind of, this is how the Dolphin Way is designed. This is how this talk actually is designed. I started with the dilemma. How did we get here? What is the problem? The problem is overparenting. The problem is what's happening with our kids. A problem is the stress. What is the solution? Well, the dolphin and what it gives us and what it means. And I'll walk you through the method and leave with transformation. We can use this model to move anybody. If you're um, bringing a new policy into your workplace, some people are going to be in action. They're ready to change their computer systems. Others are in pre-contemplation. The idea of change is not on their radar. So this is really helpful to understand that motivation is fluctuating and dynamic. And the way to move people is, in fact, through listening, not speaking. And those pathways I talked about, that neuroplasticity, we walk on a path that we say, not what we hear. So for example, if a teacher is given a, 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 tw a 20 minute uh, lecture, or in my office, when I spent 20 minutes telling a young teenager that marijuana, smoking marijuana every day is not so good for him, I've, spent, I've done a really good job convincing myself that smoking marijuana every day is not good for him. <laughs> so we want to, how we get out of this is we want to ask curious, open-ended questions. So curiosity is an underrated human tool of motivation. When we come from a place of curiosity, first of all, we're moving out of freeze, fight, or flight. You can't be curious and stressed at the same time. When you're curious, you are non-judgmental, and you will be open to ask, well, I'm really curious as to why you smoke pot every day. What are you getting from it? What are, what do you, what is, how is it serving you? What are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? And now you'll get information that you need to move them along. Now you'll get the dilemma, right? And you'll move them along through the stage of change. The importance confidence ruler, this is a really helpful one if you're working with um, somebody, again, you can apply these to not just kids, but in your work life. Uh, let's say you're working uh, with a young, with a child who's maybe um, slacking off in your high, at the end of high school. You know they're smart, they, you know they're capable, you don't understand. They're losing motivation. I see this a lot. Well, if we separate and we ask two questions in a curious, open-ended, dolphin way, and we say, you know, I'm curious, on a scale of one to 10, how important is it for you, let's call her Sarah, how important is it for you to Sarah to finish high school and to go to university? You've been kind of working it your whole life and now you're kind of in grade 11, you're slacking off, but if you could wish upon a star on a scale of one to 10, where, and you could have a high school diploma with your name on it, how important would that be? What's Sarah gonna say? She's gonna take it. She's like, yeah, okay, it's 10, I know, I can't work anywhere without it. It's important. But if you ask that same question and say, on that same scale of one to 10, how confident are you that you could finish high school? She might say a lower number. There might be something going on there. She might be finding it too tough, too much pressure, too much work, hard to keep up, whatever it is. And you're gonna see a difference between importance and confidence. You can use this, ask a smoker, how important is it for you to quit smoking? They're gonna say it's high. How confident are you? It's low. Ask someone who's dealing with heart disease or obesity, how important is it for you to lose weight? Or how, like, we know. So we spend a lot of time on importance, but really often the issue is confidence. And whatever number they say, let's say little Sarah says it's, well, you know, my confidence is a four. You know, I have this really mean teacher and all these uh, the SATs are stressing me out and I just can't keep up with all my gymnastics. So she says a four, and then you say, well, why did you say a four and not a zero? 
you go back. And Sarah's going to say, well, I know school's important. I used to be, I used to have better grades. I used to be able to do it. I didn't have this problem with concentration before. And she's going to start walking on the path of motivation. Okay, so this is a very helpful tool. These are all in the book. Um, some of them are on my website. Uh, I'm going to leave you with one last one before we get to part two, and it's called the keys. And the dolphin keys uh, is an acronym, and uh, the K is kill the tiger. Okay, so you can't start roaring or anxious or stressed. Use empathy. So that's the second powerful human tool of motivation. When we come from an empathic place, you can almost get anything done. That's also how cults work, by the way. Um, identify your child's goals, and then a statement of success. Okay, this is almost magic. It's not quite magic. It won't work the first time, but if you consistently apply it, it will work. Let me give you some examples. Let's say it's a younger child. They're late in the morning. Anyone have kids who are late in the morning? Yes. Okay. I know it's hard to get going in the morning. Empathy. That's all it is. You're side by side, shoulder to shoulder. You see it's difficult. Identify their goal. Your goal was to not be late again. You don't want to go to the principal's office, or you didn't want your teacher to get mad, or whatever it might be. And come on, I know you can move a little bit faster. Okay, it's not going to happen like that, but we can use this approach to help from becoming the jellyfish, which is like, I can't take this. The tiger micromanaging, literally putting their shoes on for them, and the kid is eight or nine, and they don't know how to tie their shoelaces. It, are there any teachers here? Because they, teachers have told me that they're seeing more older and older kids who don't know how to zip up their backpacks or tie their shoelaces or do these basic things. Okay, your kid doesn't want to do homework. Kill the tiger. Empathy. I used to hate doing homework too. That's a great one. Who liked doing homework as a child? We can all use this one. We can all use anything from our own childhood. Really powerful. Move us into a place, that shoulder to shoulder place. However, if you don't want to miss out on free time or recess or whatever it is, find a goal for them. And good thing you pick up things once you put your mind to it. Go through two other quick ones. Oh, my clicker is resist going to soccer practice. Uh, empathy here would be, ah, uh, oh, you look so tired today. So that's true. They might be tired. Our kids might be tired. Give an empathic statement. And, but remind them of their goal, but you only way to prepare for that game. Uh, and I know you feel great when you get on the field. So these are simple, not easy, effective. Doesn't want to practice piano. You could burn all the stuffed animals and yell at them, or you could try this. Um, you're getting super frustrated and tired, but if you don't get this song right, you won't make it. And I know you can try one more time. Okay, simple, not easy. They'll work in um, professional situations, too. OK, so the second part, you guys have been great, but we're going to go through this part a little bit faster, um, is a balanced lifestyle. And this is really equally important. This is the second part of the dolphin way. I'm going to give you some cool neuroscience, walk you through uh, how our brains work with that intuition system I mentioned. So when we humans do something important, for our adaptation. Remember, adaptability is the key to success to get us to where we want. Like sleep, because we can't even think, let alone problem solve and adapt when we're sleep deprived. The motivation centers in our brain light up, they get stimulated, and we are rewarded with a feeling of well being. Okay? Anybody not feel good when they're asleep, when they've had some good sleep? Everybody's brain will work like this. You go from Iceland, you go to Africa. Okay? We are naturally driven, pushed, rewarded, motivated to do certain activities that keep us healthy, that keep us happy, that give us the ability to adapt, because nature wants us to adapt. Our biology wants us to survive. When we're sleep deprived, what do we feel? We all feel irritable. We feel sad. We feel tired. We feel glum. Those are signals reminding us 
to go get our reward. Remember how good it felt to sleep? Go get that, that's important. So that's our nature, our biology, our intuition directly speaking to us. And if we can keep this in mind, we can remember what naturally motivates us. And I think a way to um, remember this, so this is where I use the metaphor of the dolphin again, because I say we humans are in trouble because we've forgotten what it means to be humans. My patients tell me they're too busy to sleep. And I say, well, the dolphin is, lives in the ocean. It's a mammal. It can be eaten by a shark, and it has to hunt for its food. But it manages to alternate its brain hemisphere and sleep with one eye open. This is not an option. This is our biology. And sometimes we have to look outside ourselves to see ourselves. And when they tell me they're too busy to sleep, then I tell them, well, then you're too busy to be healthy, and you're too busy to be brilliant. You're too busy to adapt. You're too busy to thrive and be successful. So I want to leave you with this, this, this word called pod. And it's the three things that are really missing in our lives, our kids' lives. Um, and you can remember them this way. What do you think the P stands for? Play. There you go. Do our children look like they are lit up with joy when they're playing? Our kids are heavily rewarded to play. They are lit up with dopamine. Their motivation pathways are going crazy. And we are too as adults. When we read a good book, when we go and um, try something new that we enjoy, when we pick up our hobby or painting or golf, whatever it is. So play is heavily rewarded by nature, heavily rewarded by our own biology. And why? Why is it so important? Why do dolphins play every day? It releases tension. It releases tension, yeah. It regulates our emotion. In fact, people wait a long time to see me, and a lot of the therapists I work with play with the kids. Play therapy is used for all kinds of things. Why else is play important? Learning. And it's a specific type of learning. Play is how we learn through trial and error. It is the only place that we are not evaluated, so we will take risks, we will learn from mistakes, we will become comfortable with uncertainty. So play is really powerful, and that's why we are meant to do it. That's why our children are driven, driven to do it. They're motivated, they're pushed to do it by their own biology. Now, I have to say play, uh, I have to, clarify what I mean by play. So I'm using Lego here. Uh, how many of you have read the intro of Dolphin Way yet? Maybe, okay. So play, I mean unstructured play, like Lego of my childhood or your childhood. So I was the fifth child, right? And my Lego was all chewed up and broken. Uh, but it was limitless in imagination. It was never wrong. I could make whatever I wanted. It was creative. It was brain boosting. That's play. And the Lego of today is like the play of today, today's childhood. It's a microcosm. It is complicated. It is expensive. <laughs> really expensive. Why is it so expensive? Because we're marketed towards it, right? It's a new set every season, and it really is a microcosm. When we look at how Lego has changed, it's really how childhood has changed. It's full of directions. It's full of instructions. There's a right answer. What kind of play is that? It's fragile. It can break. It makes kids rigid, anxious, perfectionistic. So this is the childhood our kids are in, and this is the games that they're playing. Now, I'm nothing against Lego, the old Lego, but it really speaks to how things have shifted and how important free play is. And when we think about it, kids have lost 50% of free time in the last 30 years. And free and structured play is what stimulates that prefrontal cortex, that frontal part of our brain, that area responsible for strategy, for abstract thinking. So play is how we adapt, okay? We adapt through play. And when our kids don't play, they don't know how to adapt. They don't have all those skills that we talked about. 
Okay, the O. The O stands for others, okay? Does anyone feel good when you're bonding socially, when you're connecting with people? How do we feel when we contribute, when we give, when we, when we give something, advice, help? We all feel good, okay? Go from Iceland to Africa, our human brain is rewarded for social connection and social contribution. This is a fact. And social bonding is not socializing superficially, and it's definitely not social status. It's meaningful social connection. And it is highly motivating, okay? So those motivation centers get lit up, every human, when we are working with others. And when we're not, when we're disconnected, when we're hyper-competitive, when siblings don't know each other in the same family because they're being shuffled off to activities and there's no family dinner anymore, and dinner's in the car, kids become disconnected socially. And it's as much of a risk factor as smoking. And I tell my, the patients I work with, I say, if you don't believe me that social um, connection, meaningful social connection is so important, think of the biggest, um, the most effective form of human torture, something that leads to self-mutilation. You guys know what it is? It's well documented. Solitary confinement. Okay, that's all we have to do to torture ourselves. So our kids are experience a sense of disconnection. They don't they need a sense of purpose beyond themselves. It's not about number one. Number one's important sometimes, but think of your own life and think of a time where you were ready to give up, you didn't have motivation, having a connection to something beyond yourself. A pet, a job, a purpose is probably what kept you going. So we are naturally rewarded to connect and contribute, but uh, these messages we're forgetting um, these natural rewards. I say we're over-gathering, over-competing, and we're forgetting the other things that are very naturally rewarding to us, and that's the O. And the D is simply downtime, okay? So downtime, I've talked a lot about sleep, I can go on and on about sleep, um, but this slide is really helpful to just remember uh, our brains function in a state of balance, okay? So we definitely need some stimulation or stress, too much, and we unravel. So I had a young girl who was, uh, came to me for an ADHD assessment, and I asked, why are you, what, what's the concern? And uh, her mom told me that uh, every time she studies, she looks out the window, and her teacher noticed that every time she's in class, she's looking out the window at the clouds or the trees. And I took her history, and she was pretty much busy all day. And she actually never had any time to just look out the window, contemplate life, contemplate nature, observe, see what was happening around her, integrate what was occurring. And she couldn't sleep at night. So the answer was they kept, her parents kept her busy all day so that she would be so exhausted she'd fall asleep. Now that's the exact opposite of what we want to do. We actually want to give our kids time to unwind in ourselves during the day so we can integrate what we've seen and felt and heard. So downtime. And this is, you know, this is California. Like the top, many of the companies here started, um, like Google and Intel and Twitter and such, are bringing in meditation rooms and nap pods and Huffington Post has all this sleep stuff because we actually perform better. We know we perform better. The human brain peaks. Uh, when we have that downtime. So the daily dose of pod is a great prescription. I write it on a prescription pad now um, with all my patients. I wanna give it to you. I want you to give it to all your friends and everybody you know. Um, and because it is highly motivating, but is, these are things that are lacking in our lives and our kids' lives. And they lead to adaptability. And in the end, we want I just wanna leave you with kind of a summary, which is what we've walked through is this idea of balanced parenting, not the jellyfish, not the tiger, this balanced dolphin approach, collaborative, firm yet flexible, plus this balanced lifestyle, play, connection, downtime, simple stuff, the way many of us grew up, but not easy, is actually gonna get us much quicker to the 21st century skills. It's actually a great time to be a parent because these are the skills that are required. And do any of you know what um, 
what's being dubbed the 21st century now when we look at the history of humans, like we went from the agricultural era to then manufacturing. So agriculture, we grew food as our economies, manufacturing, we made things. Then we moved into information and service era. Does anyone know what the current era is going to be or is being called? It starts with a C too. Okay, it's the it's being called the conceptual era. Okay, so the era of concepts the era of ideas. Anything that can be automated will be. Anything that can be outsourced will be. What's left? Human skills, human creativity, collaboration, communication. So it's a really good time to be a parent because the 19th century was very left brain dominant. We really needed this left brain logic analysis technical skill because that was the jobs of the time and that's how we moved up. Technology globalization has changed so much where we need these right brain skills, this EQ, this intuitive, emotional, social brain, big picture meaning, but really it's that integration. It's the integration. So it doesn't make sense to work with just half our brain. Uh, the 21st century is the conceptual era. So more than ever, this dolphin, this balanced approach, whatever you want to call it, intuitive um, approach, balanced parenting, uh, is really the time is right more now more than ever. So all of those things that scared us, all of those things that scared us, hold on, they're so scary, they're not coming. Technology, right? Um, globalization, anything that can be automated will be, anything that we outsource will be. The actual things that scared us, that flew us into freeze, fight, and flight are the things that are actually can help us because it's why we're in the conceptual era. Work-life balance is going to be more important for our kids than ever before. That stress, 21st century being the stress of the ep epidemic. So, and the university admissions, the jobs that we talked about are shifting. And any of you who work in the workplace have heard soft skills, are looking, you, you, will, you can look at an, um, interview committees, what they're looking for, a team player. People rarely get fired for technical difficulties as much as they're getting fired for not being able to collaborate, to communicate, to have that critical thinking. So here we are. And um, you know, this is, I actually say, a time to be optimistic, uh, a time where it's, we can kind of go back and really review how it is that we got here and where we need to be. And I say simple is not easy. I'm hoping that I was able to move you from knowing to doing. Um, to help spark some of your intuition, help move you out of freeze, fight, or flight. Um, some of these tools may help in your personal life and your professional life, but really, I hope we answered some of these questions, and I can't wait for the Q&A, but what skills lead to 21st century success? Adaptability, CQ, we know these. How do we, culti how do we cultivate these? Through that balanced relationship and a balanced lifestyle. So Albert Einstein said, look deep into nature. I say this is not my invention, it's not my theory. I'm just giving you the science, um, the nature, uh, that what we know. And um, that's my website, by the way. I do have like videos and uh, some of these tools there, so you don't have to buy the book, but I am signing the book outside. Thank you very much. Dr. Shimmy Pang. You're scaring me a little bit Am because I? the little guy asked for, asked Santa for Legos. Oh. <laughs> and I went yeah. to look for just like a box of blocks and yeah. couldn't find it. You can't all, find that, them. all they have is sets, even yes. for the little ones. Yeah, yeah, and they're gone. And actually, I, heard, I did hear from Lego. Mm -hmm. um, the Lego, <laughs> yeah, uh, Peter Gray, who is a Lego sp spokesperson, asked, and we sent Lego. So they're reviewing the book right now. We'll see what they say. Okay. Maybe I'll have to borrow your yeah. fifth child chewed up Legos yeah. <laughs> for the little guy. If you have questions written down on index cards for Q&A with Dr. Kang, please raise your hand so that Diana, Emily, or Sue can come by to pick it up. Um, as you are handing them in, it is time right now for a very quick message from Chair of Davis Parent University, Christy Fries, and Outreach Coordinator, Jody Lederman. I'll be right back. I'll be back. You get that side, Christy. 
<laughs> Can you help me take that out? I'm a little too tall for that. Such a problem. <laughs> Hello, thank you for being here. I'm Christy Fries, and this is Jody Lederman. Good evening, everyone. Wonderful to see you all. Um, what a great talk by Dr. Shimi Kang. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm gonna go home and break all of my son's huge Lego structures and make him rebuild them into something more unique. That was a good point, good point. Yeah, it was great. Very, very powerful information, Dr. Kang. Um, it is not easy to be a parent, and a uh, lot of tips here to learn how to, to help us navigate through this exciting time. Um, let's see who's here tonight. I'm curious. How many of you, with a show of hands, have been to a Davis Parent University lecture before? Our repeat customers. Wow. Awesome. And how many of you are first timers at one of our events? Oh, pretty split. Very good. Well, tell your friends and family and colleagues to come and join us. It's a free event, and we would love to have as many parents in Davis come as, as possible. Yeah, it is. It's great to see all of you. As, as Pam mentioned, it's our sixth year providing the lecture series. Um, we have two lectures, one in the spring, or one in the fall, and one in the spring. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, we, we sold out. How did that work for um, tonight, Christy? Yeah, we, we actually had 530 tickets reserved by early November. So as you can see, is, which is predictable, we have seats available and we were able to take everyone that came off of a wait list in tonight. So it does help us for you to go ahead and reserve your tickets in advance. So the question is, how did DPU get Dr. Kang to visit us from British Columbia tonight? And how does DPU continue to get these top-notch speakers here to Davis? Well, as you've heard us say before, it takes all of your interest, the hard work of our amazing parent ed representatives, and funding. It takes raising funds, funding for the speakers, and they, as, I've, as we've all said before, they don't work for free, and we wouldn't want them to, you know? So. Um, um, talking about funding, our next DPU event is Wednesday, April 29th, and that's not it. Um, her name is Jennifer Senior, and she's a New York Times bestselling author of All Joy and No Fun, The Modern Paradox of Parenting. And if you haven't read the book, it is fantastic. Um, it's a little bit different take. Um, it focuses more on the parent instead of the child. And um, if you have time to watch her TED Talk on YouTube, I laughed, I cried, it's fantastic. So that's just a little preview of what's coming up in April. So look for that. You won't be, you won't be sad if you come. No, and just like with NPR Public Radio, we need to ask you for some help before you leave us. Uh, the way we've been able to raise funds thus far is support from the PTAs, the PTOs, and our community sponsors, so thank you. But over half of the DPU funding comes directly from all of you who are here tonight, you who find value in the parent university. So um, if you would and could take your envelope out that you were given when you first walked in this evening and donate anything that you can, usually $10 is what um, we find um, is the typical amount. Um, we do accept cash and checks. If you're writing a check, the check can be made out to YFRC, which is YOLO Family Resource Center. So just put YFRC. And in the memo, just put um, DPU. And then you can pass your envelope to the, what's that called? The inner, the inner aisles. And our wonderful, beautiful, fabulous parent ed reps will pick those up with their colorful baskets right now. Thank you.
Okay, we'll wrap this up. Thank you so much for your donations. Thank you for being here. And we have a Q&A session with Shimi and Pamela Wu, and we will t let them take over. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome back to the stage, Dr. Shimi Kang. Hi. This is exciting. Hi. Thank you for coming from British Columbia. Thank you. Um, I found your comments um, so insightful, and so did our audience, as a number of them have submitted questions. Um, here's one of them. You talk a lot about motivation and raising kids who are intrinsically motivated. What exactly motivates us, and how can this knowledge help us to raise motivated kids? Yeah, uh, so it's, I mean, motivation complex issue, and like I said, it's not something one has or doesn't have. We mm -hmm. want to move away from that. That's a motivated kid. That's not a motivated kid. We all have it. And uh, when you, if you think of that slide of the human brain, there are certain, a really great way to understand motivation is think about anything that makes you naturally feel good, give you a sense of well-being or joy naturally, okay? So drugs, alcohol, cocaine aren't part of that. Um, and shopping uh, is, people Chocolate. say, well, but, <laughs> but people get confused and say, well, shopping feels good and being number one feels good. Mm -hmm. And it's true, we are rewarded to gather or shop, we are rewarded to compete, be number one. But what's happening is we're over-gathering, mm -hmm. okay, we're over-competing, and we're neglecting those other powerful motivators that I talked about, like pod. And our brain doesn't work that way. We can't just sleep more and, that, and, and we feel better. There's a limit, right? So we can't, once we eat enough, eating more isn't going to serve us. So over-gathering, gathering more and more stuff, or over-competing, at a certain limit, it's not. So we have to really be mindful of really the balance. And when our kids have enough of all of it, they're gonna be naturally motivated. So that's why the word pod, bringing play, connection, uh, downtime, no kid is motivated when they're sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. So we know that, um, and play is a direct road to passion. Uh, others is a direct road to purpose. And these are really ultimately, when we look at the research on motivation, this is what motivates us, passion and purpose with some health, basic health. In your book, you talk about three different types of parents, authoritarian, um, permissive, and authoritative. And this question from one of our audience members is, how do I self-identify when I'm being one of those three? Oh, good question. So yes, so we all have it in us. Again, not a label, but a metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, self-identify really is connecting to yourself. So if you, if you remember that slide with the stress, freeze, fight, or flight, mm -hmm. and you're moving in automatic on that hamster wheel, you're not an awareness of choice. When we take some time out and we get ourselves into that place of calm, I think you'll know. Uh, if you're being, if you're pushing too hard, if you're pushing too far, mm -hmm. um, and if you don't know, we're meant to raise kids in a community or a village or a pod. So, ask a trusted co-parent or somebody else in your pod. Uh, that's really important. I talk a lot about again, very simple. There's 60 prescriptions in the Dolphin Way. None of them are medication. They're all communication tools and lifestyle tools. But the very first prescription is. Uh, deep controlled breathing hmm. and I remember the editors in New York they're like are you really sure that this is the first thing you want to tell parents I say yes because um, we're not breathing mm -hmm. um, and simply kind of stopping and taking deep breaths very simple science really expands those receptors mm -hmm. in our lungs that sends a signal to our brain that we're okay if we can teach our children deep controlled breathing we can help them before an exam before a game before a speech so uh, that's a very simple, not easy tool that can take us out and into an awareness of choice. So that's what I would recommend, and I think that they would know the answer. Breathing is something that I've really been reading a lot about lately, and probably, probably a lot of you have too, that breathing is really sort of an underrated or overlooked tool. Right, yeah, it's the basics. And you know, the, the dolphin is a metaphor. I say we've gone so far off what it means to be human mm -hmm. that we, uh, you know, we can look outside ourselves to see ourselves, like breathing, food. I mean, when we look at how off balance we've become, uh, you know, people tell me all the time they're too busy to sleep, they're too busy to eat healthy, and literally they're too busy to breathe. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. uh, I think that explains a lot of the problems we're seeing. 
Another audience question is this, how would you suggest that I encourage free creative play in my young child when they only want to play with me ah, during downtime? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, again, play is something that's always been uh, with humans. It's in all the animal kingdom. Polar bears play every day, animals play. Really interesting research on play. I'm just going to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. um, when kittens are not allowed to play, little baby kittens, they actually um, <coughs> bite and scratch too much as adults. So we actually believe that mm -hmm. a lot of the social cues, uh, the push and pull of a social conversation is developed at the beginning, um, the rough and tumble jostling play. So I think that uh, just to trust that, first of all, you're, if your child doesn't know how to play, um, I don't think that, uh, I think we have to just trust the fact that if they're human, it's in there. Now, you may want to get rid of any distractions because screens and TV and iPads can really interfere with that. And um, perhaps uh, play with your child. They're telling you something. Maybe they have a need to connect or bond. Uh, but after a certain point, um, kind of encourage them to find different things. Now, there's seven different play personalities. So not all kids play the same way. Some are collectors. Like if you remember collecting coins or dolls, mm. others are directors. They're the ones who want to kind of be the teacher. Others um, play through imagination or storytelling. So it's, it's in your child um, and perhaps they need some time alone uh, and their imagination will spark. When parents tell me my kid says they're bored, so that in many ways it's a great thing because boredom is what sparks our imagination. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I also hear though kids who have been busy from a very young age are craving stimulation. That doesn't mean when the parents say, well, my kid wants all these activities, mm -hmm. When you start life in a box, you crave a box. So that doesn't mean it's all necessarily all good. So balance it out. And I say nature will take over. I think that's really a good point because I think it's so easy to say, why don't you just please go play by yourself? But if children have different styles of play, mm -hmm. then you really sort of need to identify that right. because perhaps the tools or toys that you're providing to your child aren't really right. um, compatible with the way they play. Sure. Yeah. And be curious, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really how we see our passions. You know, we'll, we'll, you know, and you ask older parents, you can, as a child, you can see what you're nat naturally drawn towards. And it's a really insight into, into our kids' passions and interests. This audience member asks, how would a dolphin parent guide, not direct, their child um, with technology, rules for TV, phones, Instagram, especially for teens? This is probably something you see a lot in your practice. Yes. I think this is probably one of the number one issues mm -hmm. right now is technology because it's everywhere mm -hmm. and it's not going anywhere and actually kids are needing it for schools mm -hmm. and education homework. Uh, so when we think of the metaphor, I think we, no child has access to technology without a parent, right? So we give our kids access to technology and so we don't want to be the jellyfish and say, you know, it's everywhere, I can't, I can't control it. Um, and, but we also, you know, we don't want to be the tiger because then we'll get pushed back. So I think I would use the approach to technology no different than how you manage diet, okay? There's a lot of junk food out there um, and there's a lot of junk technology out there have those conversations with your child about healthy use of technology, just how you would use the framework of diet. We don't let our kids just be jellyfish, eat whatever they want, mm -hmm. and we don't want to micromanage that either. We want them to make healthy choices. So that paradigm might help you, firm yet flexible. Um, this one is tough because every household has different rules, mm -hmm. but you can set your rules uh, because that's setting your values. Uh, and one thing I say to my kid is that balance is important. So. Uh, it's, you know, I know you love technology. You can use the keys, mm -hmm. kill the tiger. Mm -hmm. I can see you love your games. I can see you light up with joy. I can see how much it's fun for you. I want that for you. However, your goals, you know, it's also important to get your homework done. Make sure you have time with your friends. Make sure that you're sleeping enough. And this, I know that we can kind of get to that balanced place, the statement of success and then you have to stick to it because they will pull all kinds of antics. Mm -hmm. um, but once they know that you're not going to give in, mm -hmm. uh, and my kids did it, they do it at really, you know, my boss is over for dinner is when they start asking for it because <laughs> they think I'm going to give in and they're very smart that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll try that, but you know, and, and talk to them and explain it. And mm -hmm. it, it, it is a constant battle. It's no different than diet for us right now. Oh, by doing the keys thing too, you're really sort of tapping into their own intrinsic motivation because this is about your goals. Sure. 
Yeah, and reminding them, it's like, you know what, when you're at a really tough place, you can say, look, I might be able to control this now, mm -hmm. but I'm not gonna be able to do this forever, mm -hmm. and in the end of the day, you're gonna have to make these healthy choices, um, but my, my, my job, my role here is to help guide you towards those. This audience question says, how do you prevent overparenting a child with ADHD who is not intrinsically motivated but wants to go to college? And I think that this is really applicable to you know, families whose maybe children don't have ADHD as well. Yeah. It's hard to not want to overparent and step in and help and push, right. um, especially if your child says, I do want to go to college and yeah. I do want to succeed. Right. Um, so what do you do? So great question. Um, I see a lot of kids with ADHD learning disorder dyslexia and just kids who don't have that, but it's getting so tough. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would, again, I'd go back to the keys, I'd go back to empathy, and we don't want to battle our children, battle a system that might be very difficult for our children who have different styles of learning. Mm -hmm. We gotta remember the current school system came out of the 19th century Prussian model. It was designed to create obedience and discipline by the King of Prussia, and then it spread across Europe during the Industrial Revolution as a factory-based way, manufacturer way of, of school, and it hasn't pretty much changed in 200 years. We're seeing the shift, the 21st century skills in the school place. So the way I would do that is I would align with the child, and I would say, I'm with you on this. You're right. Some of these classes don't make sense. Some, some of the, this structure is really hard for you. Be with them and um, recognize that uh, that um, have that empathy and say, however, this is a system we're in. These are hoops. I can help you get through them. What do you need? But don't put the value on it unless it's true for your child. Help them jump through the hoops because what's great is the 21st century is great for the ADHD mm -hmm. brain. It's great for these um, kids that are, we call them cognitively flexible, not necessarily linear thinkers. So they're going to do fine once they get through the hoops. Um, uh, many times, like freelancing is like the, the biggest thing that, um, so the kids with ADHD are, are, have more of a future than ever before. Hmm. The importance and confidence is really helpful, because mm -hmm. if you ask, if you, can, if you can divide that and say to the ADHD kid, well, how important is it for you to go to university when you're calm and curious, they're going to give you the answer. The confidence is going to be lower, and so you don't have to sit there and lecture them on how important university is, they know that. So mm -hmm. all of those tools can help. This is the last question. Um, now you and I are both um, immigrants' kids. Can you talk a bit about the cultural aspects to parenting? Oh, so I've been interviewed from everywhere from Tel Aviv, South Korea, China, um, all over the world. This has been a really interesting experience for me. Uh, and the data shows, and my clinical experience, um, the city I work in, less than 50% of the population speaks English as a mm -hmm. first language. It's a very multicultural um, city. And the tiger, jellyfish, dolphin style is in all cultures. There's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, we do tend to see some trending. What's interesting, the tiger parent, when they looked at um, Asian American children, who are excelling, most of them, in fact, a big majority of them had authoritative, that balanced parenting mm. as opposed to mm. that really extreme um, tiger parenting. The issue of immigrant kids, I think, is interesting. As an immigrant, I think there's a myth that um, those immigrant kids who might be excelling, that achievement gap that's discussed is coming from pushy parents. Well, mm -hmm. I can certainly say, uh, a lot of immigrant parents don't have the time, money, resources to overparent. Um, they're busy setting down their roots. They have uh, all these other responsibilities. So I think that that's a, a really important factor. There, that part isn't occurring. There are also often strong communities. One example I give is my dad taught me math um, when he used to drive taxi, and we mm -hmm. used to, he used to I used to count the change. But it was also an opportunity where. I think there's concepts that are very motivating. The concept of gratitude, um, I think is very powerful in many immigrant homes, that uh, gratitude for what you have, mm -hmm. optimism for the future. Um, these, when we look at like countries like Nigeria versus the UK, optimism and gratitude is at the lowest, and so is childhood mm. unhappiness. Nigeria comes really high. So I think there's a lot going on in immigrant families that's far beyond um, some of the stereotypes out there. 
We want to thank Dr. Kang and all of you for joining us tonight. We invite you to join us right now for a book signing in the front foyer with Dr. Kang, an avid reader. We also look forward to seeing you on April 29th for the next Davis Parent University lecture with Jennifer Senior, the New York Times best-selling author of All Joy and No Fun, The Paradox of Modern Parenthood. Until next time, enjoy the holidays with your families. Thank you. Good thank night. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Really, really nice to meet you. I love the book.